KFSR and CMAC present the Central Valley Ledger, a public affairs program featuring stories from all over the Central Valley with Sivag Tediosian, 90.7 KFSR. Welcome to the Central Valley Ledger. I'm your host, Sevog Tatiosian. We're recording out of the beautiful downtown Fresno studios of the Community Media Access Collaborative Fresno Clovis. And today we're talking about a serious topic, autism, with our two guests from the California Autism Center. Did I get that right? Yes. yes. Perfect. And our, our guests are Dr. Amanda Nicholson and Nikki Cernelia. Got it. Did I get that right? <laughs> yeah. Yes. I, I practiced nice in my mind several <laughs> it's times. It's a tough one. And, and I like how you used familia because uh -huh. now I'm going to remember that, exactly. by the way. That's my new trick. Yeah. So, hey, the creative trick. Uh -huh. <laughs> so, first, welcome to the program again. Thank, Thank you. you. Uh, we're talking about a serious topic here in autism, but before we talk about the details of autism, can we get your backgrounds and, you know, how did you end up here, Nikki will start with you, and sure. then Dr. Amanda will go to you. Yeah, mine, um, I actually am from the hospitality field initially, and that's what I went to school for. So uh, started in hotels about 10 years ago and came from the Hampton Inn and Suites mm -hmm. here in Fresno and was most recently the general manager there, but I had a lot of sales and marketing background and uh, actually know Amanda's business partner Will really well and they brought me onto the team to do the marketing and the uh, PR for the company and I was looking for something different at the time so it just it worked out perfectly for the timing so I'm sure you have some very interesting stories about the hotel <laughs> you know working in the hotel industry we could probably do a whole another show about that we can <laughs> and I, I love the little hotel soaps, by the way, and yeah. the little shampoos. Yeah, I'll admit I have a few extras at home that you know. <laughs> I are think the, everyone <laughs> takes a lot of those home. Yeah, you're not the only one. <laughs> so, uh, Dr. Amanda, talk about a little bit how you got involved in this field. Well, in graduate school, um, we were assigned to practicum placements, and working with children with autism was one of the prevalent uh, practicum placements that you could you could uh, be assigned to. So I started there but didn't necessarily see it as my eventual career landing. Um, so I was l interested in health in general and, uh, you know, just other topics too. Uh, but after graduate school, uh, the first job that became available was one uh, working with children with autism in Sacramento. And the one after that was also in the same area, and the one after that was two. And um, I always, I had some hobbies and interests on the side. Um, but, you know, 10 years later, I accidentally was uh, pretty experienced in the field of autism, and now it's been longer than that. <laughs> so um, I had a great deal of experience, and about 10 years ago, was hired at Fresno State in the psychology department. And one of the reasons they hired me was because of experience doing practical work with kids with autism, and they wanted to see that develop. So we did that for for eight years at Fresno State, and that department's still going strong and has a very good program. But I left three years ago to go into this private endeavor and just have a little bit more freedom, um, you know, in a private facility rather than working through the university. Has, have we changed our perspective on autism? Because I, I asked the question, because it seems like 10, 15 years ago, maybe I was too young to, you know, really look at it, but the older I get, the more people are talking about autism. I have family friends who have children with autism. And so I thought for a while maybe it's me that maybe 10, 15 years ago I didn't pay attention. But what I would like to know your perspective on that. I think that's a very common experience. And we hear that all the time when we go places and tell, tell people what we do. Um, that's a really common reaction. So I don't think it's just you by any means. I think the general public is a lot more aware. And um, citing one, one reason I don't think is possible, but I think it's partly to do with organizations like Autism Speaks. Um, it's a private organization, but they've done amazing work bringing, um, bringing it to a, a noticeable um, area. And the, higher, the better diagnostic ability that we have now, being more uh, pediatricians are more aware, teachers are more aware. So it's uh, kind of seeped its way into our, uh, to the training of the professionals that work with kids. So, um, and like you said, it's 
you're bound to talk, if you bring up the word autism with anyone, they're bound to know somebody. If it doesn't directly affect them, it probably directly affects someone they know. It doesn't skip too many, you know, there's not very many degrees of separation anymore. So um, we, we don't know why it's expanded so much entirely. There's partly better diagnostics to be accredited with that, but that's not the only reason. There seems to be a true incidence increase when they, uh, when they try to do the, the factor analysis and figure out why it's exploded so much. So not, not only better diagnostics, but also a true increase in that, we don't know why. That, that would be a great question to answer. What are some char characteristics of somebody with autism? I mean, can we point out and say, okay, that child has autism by looking at the child? Nope, you cannot. <laughs> Um, you can, it, there's a, a, a spectrum, as Nikki pointed out earlier, it's a spectrum disorder, so it's called autism spectrum disorder now. Um, autism is actually an outdated term already, um, uh, that autism is part of the spectrum, but now we say ASD as the nickname for the entire umbrella of disorder. And at the very high end of the disorder, um, you, won't, you wouldn't notice. We could, we could be walking right by and having dinner with people who might be on the spectrum, and they might be um, characterized as uh, being a little focused, or maybe their social skills aren't at the time. But you know, we all range in that area. Mm -hmm. Some people are more mm -hmm. social, some are less social. So there's a spectrum there. And maybe they tend to be a little less social or have a different way of socializing. And that's all. At the very severe end of the spectrum, um, we have individuals that can't care for themselves and don't talk and don't relate at all normally. So, and we have everything in between. So we have some with severe behaviors, some with no behavior issues, some with severe social deficits, some with no social deficits, and some who are highly verbal, mul you know, multiple languages, uh, and maybe even savant-like, and some uh, who don't talk. And there's, the, the whole spectrum's covered in between. But when we look at each other, you know, we all have kind of the, you know, some of us have better social skills, some less, some of us right. enjoy more time alone, some less, you know, so we, it's interesting how it falls along those lines. So it's a difficult disorder, it's a difficult thing to recognize because of its variance, but, um, but there are common characteristics shared within that diagnosis nonetheless, even though it varies a great deal. So Nikki, when you are talking to people about autism, are, do people know what autism is? I mean, you know, I've been educated here. I've, mm -hmm. you know, I, I read the news every day. I follow the news on the media. Right. And I still don't exactly got a grasp of, have a grasp of autism. Well, when you're out you? talking to people about this organization, what are people sharing with you? Well, I, I mean, just like Amanda said, because it is such a spectrum and there is such a variance, I think a lot of people are still very confused about what autism is. And you know, not being in the industry for very long, I constantly am still learning things about ASD all the time from Amanda, from our clinical directors. And so, um, you know, I think what's important is that talking about it and doing things like this and getting it out there is there is more awareness and there is more acceptance um, for people that are on the spectrum. So, um, you know, it's, it's, it's good to get it out there. And like you said, it's just become such a bigger, bigger thing that everyone's talking about. And there's some level of, of knowledge, but we're still trying to educate as much as we possibly can. I have two small children, mm -hmm. and you know, one is less than two and a half years old, the other one's a little over one years old, one year old. And so when something happens to them, I quickly think, okay, did I do something wrong here? Or when they're crying, did it, is it me? Did I do something wrong? Or, you know, did I pick them up wrong or something? Do parents blame themselves when their ch children have autism? Are you finding that the parents you're working with are, are saying, you know, what did I do wrong? Is it me? I think it used to be a little bit more like that. And you can probably speak on yeah. that a little bit more. I think we've improved yeah. over the past few decades on that. But it something that seeped in in, uh, in the 70s, 1970s, it was pretty prevalent, in the 80s it was still around. Um, there was a book published, a very unfortunate book by a person who didn't do his research correctly, and um, it, it kind of proposed that theory. And it's been, it's taken decades to put that down and to show that there's absolutely no truth to that whatsoever. And so even though we've got really well-educated parents, some, some parents who know a lot about the topic now, 
um, I think there's still uh, a worry in the back of their minds, you know, like what, um, even if they don't take the personal responsibility, but like, you know, what could have been different, what might have happened, it's a hard question not to ask. And with the child that has any kind of problem, yeah. it, it probably goes on in your parent in, the, in a parent's mind. I have kids too, and just you know, you want you want to make sure everything's perfect and everything's done right. And even when your child doesn't have a diagnosable kind of disorder, you even think like, huh, I wonder if they're getting too much screen time or if they're getting. So we're just hard on ourselves as parents. And if your child does have a um, an issue that you're really that's mysterious and difficult to diagnose and difficult to treat, then I, you know, it just compounds all the more. So we try to put that myth to uh, death, <laughs> to not yeah. just arrest. We try yeah. to kill it. That is absolutely not true. It's no no more preventable than a brain tumor could have been for a parent. Um, it just happens. We know that there's a genetic and an environmental correlation, and uh, that's as best as we understand it right now. And it sounds like we still don't know exactly what right. causes this thing. Well, and I think that's what makes parents feel that way is yeah. because it is such a unknown, we still don't know what causes it really truly, besides what Amanda mentioned, but when you, when you don't necessarily know why, it causes you to think, well, maybe I did something wrong, which is not the case. I found something interesting when I was looking at your website, is you have a parents' night out, mm -hmm. or, or an event for parents. Tell us about that, and why is that even important? Yeah, well, we try to do you know, not just, not just the, you know, behavioral therapy services for the kids that we serve. You know, there's a whole other part of that, which is their family. And, you know, parents work really hard to make sure that their kids are getting the services that they need and, um, you know, doing, taking their kids to, you know, to school and then maybe their, you know, speech therapy and then coming to our center you know, there's so much that they've got going on. Yeah. And it's stressful anyway. You know, it's, I don't have kids yet, but it's stressful to have kids anyway. And then if you have all these other therapies and things that you're doing on top of it, sometimes you just need a break, you know? And so we uh, developed something called Parents' Night Out. We try to do it about once a quarter. And uh, it's just a night that we have, you know, the kids can come to the center. The parents can go out for two and a half hours. Mm -hmm. They can <laughs> sit at their house if they want to. They can go watch a movie, go to dinner, you know, just I, anything. Go get laundry done, whatever they want to do with just peace and quiet. And so we offer that to our clients and uh, have it right now at both of our Fresno centers. And it's our most popular event because it's just such a nice way to kind of give back to our clients and say, we know you need a break sometimes, so bring us the kids and you're good. <laughs> I'm sure the parents appreciate that little bit of time they have for alone time and right. you know to go catch a movie or whatever anything exactly we, we take the siblings too so they drop them all right. off and and are free mm -hmm. to go and you know when you're a parent of a child with a special need it's not always easy to find a babysitter that you feel comfortable with right. so it, we feel all the more important mm -hmm. um, to be able to provide that for them so they know they're in good hands and in a familiar familiar place yeah what should parents watch for what is it that the characteristics are. I know it's different. I know we talked about there's a full spectrum, but how can I, how, what am I watching? I guess the better question is what am I looking for in my children? Yeah. To see great if they have autism question. or not. There are some, it's a huge spectrum, so it's, it's hard. The variance is huge. However, there are some red flags that are unique to autism. Um, so language delay is not one of them. Language delay, we see that across a number of things. It's certainly one of the markers of autism. So if the child's speech is developing slowly, it's a concern, something to get checked out, but it's not indicative of autism per se, not only, certainly a red flag, but not the marker. But things that are more unique to autism include um, the lack of eye contact, like the billboard outside the studio lack says. Lack of eye contact. Lack I mean, of eye contact. Sometime, and I hate to interrupt you, but... Sometimes I think people perceive that as, oh, how shy. rude, right. or yeah. how shy, shy or, or, rude or, or you're hiding parenting. something, you're not looking in, yeah, in the eye, right. but what you're saying is that there might be a medical condition. It's a different mm -hmm. sort of thing. So uh, a difficulty making eye contact, uh, reluctance to make eye contact. Also the lack of gestures at a very little age, at a very young age. So, um, you know, little ones point all the time to things or they mm -hmm. gesture to things. Like, I want that, give me, or some. Um, when we see no gesturing, it's a huge concern. 
Also, um, imitation. Even babies, if you stick your tongue out at them or open your <laughs> eyes really big, they'll, they, they usually imitate that back. And so if we don't see imitation skills at a very young age, that's a huge concern. Um, children with other types of disorders usually still do those things. They still point, they still imitate. So without that, it's a big concern. And mostly it's when we see more than one thing happen at a time. So just not gesturing all by itself, there could maybe other explanations. It'd be, but if you see more than one thing going on, lack of eye contact, lack of gesturing, sleep, speech is delayed, tantruming that's unusual. I mean, all kids tantrum, all kids throw a fit every now and then, but if it seems unusual, length of time, unusual reasons, more than you'd expect, that's something. And then stereotypical behavior like flapping hands or jumping or walking on your toes, th that's usually not seen in other kinds of disorders. Um, and then also any of, any of those things of verbal ability came in but then dropped off or if they had eye contact but then it went away. The regression of that skill, that's a huge red flag. So if I hear you correctly, you could have a case where a child is exhibiting all proper behavior and then they hit a certain point and things yes. start going downhill. So yeah. autism can sneak up on you, it sounds like. I hear it all the time. One of the um, best interviews that I heard about this was a mom saying that it seemed as if the circuit breakers just kept switching off. Like they had this happy, beautiful toddler and then just switched off the circuit breakers. That's, that's not my example, but I thought that illustrated it really well. Um, and it's heartbreaking. It's, you try to figure out what's happening and um, we often hear that um, they express concerns about a language delay and we're told, oh, don't worry about it. You know, kids develop speech late. It's fine. It's normal. My, you know, my cousin's kid didn't talk till yeah. he was seven, right. something like that. <laughs> so it's, it can be really frustrating to try to tease out what's going on with that. But those, uh, those uh, early markers are really important. And there's some good online tools. Um, I sound like I'm promoting Autism Speaks a good deal, <laughs> not intentionally, but, but um, they've got great resources. But they have great resources. Sounds like a great resource. They're a they trusted do. website. They have um, validated mm -hmm. stuff on there. They don't really try to spin it in a particular way other than scientifically based right. material. So they're a trusted place to go and it's easy to remember. So I could say other ones too, but yeah. the scientific names are hard. Uh, but Autism Speaks is a good place to go. Well, and a lot of blog posts too for, of parents that are actually going through it. Yeah. So, you know, yeah. you get that kind of relatable resource as well. Yeah. This is a tough business to be in. I mean, you know, you have children, they have developmental issues, they have autism and the spectrum is wide. Why do you do what you do? I mean, it could be, it could be a rewarding job, mm -hmm. but the flip side of that is it could be a really tough job. So I'll, both of you, if, if we can uh, have you answer why you do what you do. Well, I guess I'll go first because I, you know, I don't actually work with the kids on a day-to-day -day basis. So um, I hear about all of the things going on and I hear about the challenges and I hear about all the really, really awesome little successes that the kids are making all the time. And just for me, you know, coming from a completely different industry, from hospitality and going into, into this, it is really rewarding for me, even though I'm not working directly with the kids. So I, I feel like, especially with all of the community things that we do and the parent seminars and um, you know the parents' night out, things, things that I'm more involved in, that's really rewarding for me. Um, and I'm sure Amanda can speak more on the actual you know, working with the, with the kids, but that's, you know, that's how we I can, feel. We see that it makes a big impact. Mm -hmm. Like some of the community events Nikki was talking about, um, when you see that number of people show up or how enthusiastic yeah. they are, how important it is to them, makes you, makes yeah, you feel makes pretty you feel good. good. Mm -hmm. um, and from working with the kids and seeing the changes, um, it makes all, it, it's just a hugely rewarding thing. When so they're, as, hitting, when yeah. they're hitting their mark, yeah. Yeah. I could imagine yeah. that that as, could be a As very frustrating rewarding. as it can be at times, every job can be frustrating. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so um, this has these hidden rewards that are really spectacular. And a lot of it's from the kids. On a daily basis, we get little success stories from the kids. Mm -hmm. But there's also, for, for me, and I used to, I used to work with kids a long time ago, and that's wonderful. Um, but now it's also seeing the staff and how um, people, how younger people in college right now are pursuing their, uh, their career direction um, and how they light up when they see that they can make such a real difference with somebody. 
And then also the siblings, and when we get siblings that get to talk about their experience with the brother or sister on the spectrum, that is the coolest thing, to see um, how remarkable um, and sensitive and intuitive um, a person can be at that young age. So there's just, there's so much. There's, it's such a rich field. There's a lot of challenges. Yeah. Not every day is awesome. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 Most, days, most days have um, amazing hidden gems in them, make it really worth it. Yeah. Is autism curable? So, and the reason I ask the question is, you may have a parent right now thinking very negatively that their child has this. Is it curable? Yeah. So that's a tricky language, uh, language issue right there. Um, some people object to the term cure and it's really, a, a, it's, you might argue that it's a semantics kind of thing. So um, there are people that recover from autism to the point that they are indistinguishable from their peers and no longer fit the diagnostic criteria and never do again. So if you call that, a, if it's, you're okay with calling that a cure, then yes, mm -hmm. it is. That doesn't happen one in a hundred. It happens frequently enough to expect good things if you get into good treatment and have uh, all of the markers for best case scenario. So it, it's still the minority of cases um, that, the, that the indistinguishable from peers, no markers left, uh, is the case, is the outcome. But it happens enough to have hope and expectation that significant progress is possible. And even for the cases that don't make a full recovery or um, lose the diagnosis, even those cases make huge improvements, you know, to the degree that um, they can do things that they might not have before. So um, we always stress early intervention. Mm -hmm. The, I'm going to dodge off into another topic. You said tangents were fine, so. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but, um, you know, the first five commercials that are popular right now, like sing to your baby, talk to your baby, mm -hmm. the brain's developing. Well, we know that, that this is the case um, with all human beings, uh, but with somebody with autism, we know that the neurology is going wrong. Something's happening with the neurology there. So when we can impact a very young brain, the, the most significant changes can be seen. So with our younger clients, we see even more dramatic change. But um, I think it's very important to caveat that that doesn't mean that older um, children and even youth and adults can't make significant change too. They can. So brains are always changing. Just a little harder as an adult. Right? Tell us about how teachers can get involved or let's say that I'm a teacher and I don't know exactly what to look for um, in the students. How can they get involved with your organization? With our organization? Oh, that's, that's a, a good, good question. That's a new one for you, huh? <laughs> Let me write that down. <laughs> <laughs> It'll be Nikki's next project. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, we, we work, the clients that we have under our care, um, uh, part of the service that we offer is observation at the school. And um, if their parents invite us and would like us, we attend meetings with them. Um, if the teachers are okay with it, we'll observe in the classrooms and offer tips and advice and collaborate. Sometimes we have amazing teachers that can tell us what they're doing and you know we can just make sure that we work together as a team. So we definitely collaborate, um, at, but by their invitation, by parents' right. invitation and, and the school's willingness to um, extend their doors open to us. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, but the teamwork is the best possible scenario. We get a lot more accomplished when we're all working together on the same side. So teachers that are, um, are just willing, first of all, that's the first step, if they're just willing to let us in, um, Sometimes, you know, it's a little nerve wracking to have somebody come in your classroom and observe and start saying things about how you're right. doing things. So right. it's mm -hmm. not something that all teachers are eager for. Um, but we try to make uh, we try to make a very concerted effort to to uh, what, to be polite, to yeah. be respectful, <laughs> right. to understand that their area of expertise is different than ours and really be collaborative as a team. Um, and we really do appreciate that as, a, as an organization. So we hope that um, um, anything from the past about outside people coming in is not represented by us. And we've had some really nice successes working with teachers in our school districts here. We are running out of time this week on the program. How can people find out more about this topic? How can parents educate themselves? I know that there are billboards that you, <laughs> Dr. Amanda noticed. Right, billboard, right outside. Right yep. outside. <laughs> but what are some resources that you can point parents and individuals to? Well, I think the main thing is, um, you know, just going to our website, which is calautismcenter.org, 
And um, you can also find us on Facebook, which we really like to, you know, share a lot of great resources, um, great success stories, and um, we, we do a lot of social media, which is um, which is helpful, blog posts and and things from parents, and that's where we post all of our events that we have coming up, all of our seminars that have something to do with autism and parenting. Um, so that's that's a good place to start. And then, as Amanda mentioned before, the Autism Speaks website has a fantastic array of resources. You know, lots of different things. Especially, we just you know got done with the holidays, and there were a lot of great ideas and blog posts about you know the holidays are kind of a hectic and stressful time, and especially for for people on the spectrum. So, how can we make that better for them? So. A lot of great things out there. Yeah, definitely. Social media. Mm -hmm. How important has it been to your organization, and how important has it been to your clients? Well, actually, I, we have a really good um, example of that. So there's a very famous person with autism named Temple Grandin who recently came to Fresno, and we were able to let everyone know that she was coming, and she we sold out 300 tickets in about, I don't know, four hours, wow. and, and then found a bigger venue and sold out another 1,000 tickets, wow. not having any idea that it was gonna have this big of an impact, and, and we only posted it on social media. And that was one of the things that Amanda said earlier, that doing these events makes, makes people so happy, and her speaking on her life experiences with autism and showing how successful she is as an adult with autism is is very inspiring to parents a lot of our parents and people in the community that um, that have children with autism and and so things like that it really makes a difference so yeah. lastly your website mm -hmm. tell us what where it is yes so it's uh, calautismcenter.org and uh, facebook.com um, and just look for California Autism Center and Learning Group. On that note, you have been listening to the Central Valley Ledger. Our guests have been Dr. Amanda Nicholson and Nikki Cernalia. 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 Yeah. I, was, I was close. <laughs> You're very close. And I'm, in my mind, I was trying to remember familiar. familiar. <laughs> so uh, thank you two for coming and educating our audience about autism, this serious topic. Thank, thank you, you to those watching this broadcast on Comcast 93 and AT&T 99, the Community Media Access Collaborative Channels, and to those listening to this broadcast on 90.7 FM, KFSR, Fresno. Hope you enjoyed the program this week. I'm your host, Sevag Tatiosian. Lastly, thank you to our volunteer crew that made this production and every production possible. They're behind the cameras and in the studios now, making us look and sound good. Tune in next week to a new edition. KFSR and CMAC present the Central Valley Ledger every Sunday morning at 1130. For a complete program schedule, visit KFSR.org.